This is chapter 10, Anastasia again. Remember in chapter nine, Jenny and Anastasia were talking on the phone about what they've been doing. Um, obviously Jenny was on a bike ride with Robert and Anastasia went uh, to play tennis or has been playing tennis with a young boy named Steve. Um, and so they were talking to each other. Then Anastasia talks to her mother about boys and about getting married. And um, in the end, uh, at the end of the chapter, uh, she writes more of her book talking about kind of what happened to her. And her mother tells her a story of something similar to what is happening with her and Robert. Because remember, Robert thinks Sam's or Anastasia's baby brother doesn't know how to walk or can't walk because he's handicapped. Chapter 10. It's Anastasia again, Anastasia called after she had rung Gertrude Stein's doorbell, her neighbor, the old lady. I brought you something. Hello there, Anastasia again, said Gertrude Stein when she opened the door. It was amazing how Gertrude Stein's disposition or her attitude had changed in a short time. Anastasia remembered how grouchy and mean she had been the first time they had met. Now she answered the door cheerfully, always smiling. It had to do with her hair though, thought Anastasia. Now that her hair looked pretty, Gertrude Stein felt cheerful. Anastasia had noticed that she herself felt more cheerful now that she was washing her own hair twice a day with special shampoo for oily hair. She had been doing it ever since she had met Steve Harvey. The better her hair looked, the better she felt. Now that was something worth sending into psychology today, instead of a dumb Giannani survey on joggers, on people running. She would have to figure out though, how people like her father figured into her theory. Her father was almost always cheerful, even though he was bald. Her theory is that if you look good, you feel good, or your hair's nice, you feel good. Hey, Mr. Stein is getting fat. Anastasia peered into the goldfish bowl at the plump goldfish who stared back at her silently. Gertrustine laughed. I know, I think I'm feeding him too much. It's so nice to have someone to feed that I get carried away sometimes. Gertrustine said Anastasia very seriously. You absolutely have to make an effort to make some friends. You could invite friends over for dinner or you could go to their house for dinner. It's not healthy to stay all shut up in your house, feeding too much to a goldfish. But Gertrude Stein got a very stubborn look on her face. I do not like people, she said with dignity. Ridiculous, you're only pretending that because you're scared of them. What are you, some kind of social worker? No, but I know what I'm talking about. Because look at me. When I moved here, I pretended that I wasn't going to like anyone in the suburbs. You know why? Because I was scared they wouldn't like me. And then I met you, and you like me. You do like me, don't you? Yes, said Gertrustine reluctantly. And then I met Steve, and Steve likes me. At least I think he does. And now I can't wait to meet more people. Steve's going to have a cookout at his house and invite a lot of kids my age, and I'm really looking forward to it. It was all my imagination that I didn't like people in the suburbs, and it's all your imagination, Gertrude Stein. And what you should do is, you said you've bought me something. What is it? Gertrude Stein changed the subject. Oh, I forgot. Look, Anastasia held up a piece of paper, a gift certificate. Gertrude Stein took the paper and frowned at it. A lady came to the house, Anastasia explained, to welcome my mother to town. She brought lots of free stuff that the town gives to new people. Two free passes to the movies, to the cinema. Steve and I are going to use those. And let's see, my father gets a free oil change for the car at some gas station. And my mom gets a discount on a leg of lamb at the supermarket, some meat. We get dinner for four at some restaurant if we go on a Tuesday night. And then there was this one, which mom said I could give to you because she and I don't need it. A free permanent at the Clip and Curl Beauty Salon. If you get a permanent, your hair will look nice all the time without my helping you put in the rollers, without me helping you put in the rollers. Gertrude Stein looked dubious and confused. Well, she said, ha, I knew you'd say that. So I already called and made an appointment for you at the Clip and Curl. It's right next to the drugstore, close enough for you to walk. And your appointment is for 10 o'clock Saturday morning. You're taking over my whole life, Anastasia Krupnik. No, I'm not. I'm just helping you get your life started. I'm sorry if it's rude to say this, Gertrude Stein, 
But I think your life ended when Mr. Stein, the man, not the goldfish, ran off with his mandolin player. And that was 40 years ago. Gertrude Stein smiled suddenly. You're right, Anastasia, but you're also wrong. My life ended when Edward Evans married the local nursery school teacher 47 years ago. Too late to start it up again now, but all right, I'll go and get a permanent at 10 o'clock Saturday morning. Then you'll make new friends and hold on there. I will get a perm. Then I will come home and feed my fish and watch TV. One thing at a time. I'm too old for many changes. Good grief, said Anastasia suddenly. I forgot something. Mom wanted you to babysit for Sam on Saturday, and it's really important. Maybe I should call and change that appointment. No, Sam can come with me. I will need the moral support. The thought of someone who wears pampers, um, diapers, being moral support was a little weird and startling to Anastasia, but it didn't seem to solve the problem. And she was beginning to have another idea. Maybe it would be meddling in Gertrustein's life. On the other hand, she had already meddled in Gertrustein's life quite a bit, and it seemed to work out okay. If this idea worked, I have to go someplace, she announced. I'll see you later, Gertrustein. She ran to the garage and wheeled out her bike. Anastasia had already been to the small library. It was one of the first things she had done after they moved, finding the library and getting a library card. In Cambridge, there had been a branch library not far from the Krupnik's apartment. Anastasia had been going to it since she was Sam's age, not by herself at that age, of course, but holding her mother's hand. Once, just before she moved, she had figured out that if she had checked out eight books every week from the time she was two, she had taken more than 4,000 books out of that library. That was a little puzzling because the branch library was so small that she didn't think it had 4,000 books. But her mother had pointed out that sometimes she took the same books over and over again. In Cambridge, they knew her so well at the branch library that they called her Anastasia again, the way Gertrustein was beginning to. At this library, this new library, they didn't know her at all, at least not yet, which was a little depressing, but they would. She had looked through their card catalogue and discovered they were missing some of her favourite books, so she was planning to write them a letter. One book that had been her favourite for years in Cambridge described all the symptoms of leprosy in great detail. It's a book about people with skin diseases. She had checked it out regularly once every few months, just to be sure once again that she didn't have leprosy. Sometimes it was hard to tell because one of the symptoms or problems you get was an itchy ear. Every now and then, Anastasia had itchy earlobes, the bottom part of your ear. When she did, she always checked out the leprosy book so that she could read the other symptoms and be certain she didn't have them too. Now that she lived in a town whose library didn't contain the leprosy book, she didn't know what she would do when her earlobes, her ear, started to itch. So she was going to mention that in her letter to the local library. Politely and nice, of course. But right now she was headed on her bike for the building that she had noticed next door to the library. It was called the Senior Citizens Drop-In Centre. The door was open and people looked up when she entered. It was probably pretty obvious, she realised, that she wasn't a senior citizen, an old person. Anastasia was not, in fact, a senior anything. She had dropped out of Girl Scouts as soon as she realised how awful she looked in a Girl Scout uniform. So she would never be in a senior Girl Scout. And she had given up on swimming lessons just after she passed Advanced Beginner because it was such an effort not to sink. She knew she would never get her senior life-saving badge. Inside the door was a bulletin board and Anastasia read announcements of painting classes, a trip to the flower shop, a great books discussion group, le lectures and classes by a financial expert, and a course in gourmet cooking. There was also a notice of a lost cat named Boots, who was wearing a red flea collar, and there was a wedding announcement. The people who had gotten married were named Ida and Harry, so Anastasia knew that they were senior citizens. No one young was named Ida or Harry. Most of the people in the senior citizens drop-in centre had grey hair, except for one woman whose hair was bright orange 
and one man who had no hair at all. Some of them were playing cards, although they stopped when Anastasia came in and looked over at her, still holding their cards. I said four spades, one woman said, but the others didn't answer her. Two men were playing ping pong and they stopped too and looked at Anastasia. They were all pretty friendly looking, but they seemed surprised to see her there. A young woman came out of the back room, saw Anastasia and smiled. Hi there, I'm Fran McCormick, the director. Can I help you? Are you looking for someone? Anastasia introduced herself and Fran McCormick shook her hand. I have a friend, said Anastasia, who is a senior citizen. Oh, what's her name? I know everybody pretty well, said Fran McCormick. Well, her name is Gertrude, Gertrude, Gertrude Stein, but you wouldn't know her. She never goes out of her house, except sometimes to take my little brother for a walk. Everybody was listening. Even the card players had put their cards down, although the lady who had said four spades looked a little impatient. One of the ping pong players suddenly hit the ball across the net, and it went past the other player who wasn't paying attention. Ha ha! Gotcha, said the man who had hit the ball, smugly smiling. Then he turned to to listen to Anastasia, and the little plastic ball rolled into the corner of the room. Well, with so many people watching her now, Anastasia began to feel as if she was making a speech. She had never liked making speeches. When they had to give oral reports in school, like presentations, she had never once gotten a grade better than a B minus, like a 70 or 80 because she became nervous and said, ah, too often. Well, uh, let me start over, she said, when she realized so many people were listening. My friend Gertrude Stein lives next door to me and she's a senior citizen, but she's lonely. She eats all by herself, so she only eats TV dinners. And except for me and my little brother, she doesn't have anyone to talk to. Although she's interesting to talk to and, uh, her goldfish is getting fat because she feeds him too much. And she does it just because it makes her feel good to feed somebody, even if it's only a goldfish. For a moment, Anastasia felt as if that had been a stupid thing to say. But then she noticed that the senior citizens were nodding as if they understood. Some of them probably had goldfish too. Well, why don't you send her down here to us? Asked the man who had hit the ping pong ball. She wouldn't come, she'd be scared. Maybe it sounds stupid to be scared when you're all grown up and even old, but, but they interrupted her, murmuring, whispering to each other and nodding again. They all seemed to understand about being scared, even if you were old. And she pretends she's not scared by being grouchy and mean. Anastasia went on. They all nodded again. Let's send her an invitation to the square dance, called out one of the card players. She'd throw it away. She'd say, junk mail, and throw it away, Anastasia explained. So what do you suggest that we could do for her? Asked Fran McCormick. Well, since you're called a drop-in centre, began Anastasia, I thought maybe some of you could drop in on her. I could give you the address. It's not very far away. But they all began shaking their heads. Not uninvited, said a tiny white-haired lady wearing a pink pants suit. Really, that just isn't done. I wouldn't want anyone to drop in on me unexpectedly. The others agreed and Anastasia was surprised. She liked having unexpected guests when someone randomly turns up at your door. But apparently the senior citizens disagreed. She thought for a minute, well then, here's an idea. Why don't you drop in on me? I live right next door and you wouldn't be unexpected because I'm inviting you. I'll make Kool-Aid and everything and then some of them were beginning to nod their heads. And then you invite her over, said the man with no hair. Right, and you can all make friends with her. I'd come, said the orange haired woman. Me too, called out some others. When, asked someone. Well, said Anastasia, she's getting a perm on Saturday morning. The first time she's been to a beauty parlor in maybe 30 years. Saturday afternoon then, announced the bold man. How many people could make it Saturday afternoon? Hands shot up. And Frank McCormick counted 14. Anastasia wrote down her address. A thought nudged itself into the back of her head. 
By any chance, she asked the senior citizens, are any of you named Edward Evans? But no one was. Not one had, no one had ever heard of Edward Evans. Well, that would have been asking for too much. Pedaling home on her bicycle, Anastasia felt pretty good. She was sure her parents wouldn't mind. Her mother would help her make Kool-Aid. Her father would dream up some kind of entertainment, although she'd have to tell him tactically not to conduct Verdi's Requiem for the senior citizens. But maybe he could read some of his poetry to them. Then she thought of something and almost rode her bike into someone's bushes, her shrubbery. Good grief. Saturday. What on earth was she going to tell Robert and Jenny? Chapter two was not very long, Anastasia realized, reading it over. Only one sentence. But she liked the way it ended, with a mysterious reference to the young girl's past and future. Remember, she's writing a, a book, kind of about herself. It was important to be very subtle in a mystery novel, so that the readers wouldn't know exactly what was happening too early in the book. It was one of the troubles with Nancy Drew books, and they weren't subtle enough. Agatha Christie, now, those were subtle. In Agatha Christie books, you never knew what was bad and who was good. That was important. Chapter three, she wrote. In her new life, the young girl began to meet new people. A tall tennis player with blue eyes, an old woman who looked like a witch, a mysterious band of people who had regular meetings and who were stricken with astonishment when the young girl showed up unexpectedly at their hideout one day. At the same time, people from her past were still on her trail. The young man with the puzzling briefcase had found out where she lived and she received a message that he was on his way. He was bringing with him an Irish woman with a chipped tooth, with a broken tooth. There, now she had a whole cast of characters and the reader would not know yet who were villains and who were heroes. Anastasia didn't know yet either, but she would worry about that later. And that's the end of this chapter. So this chapter is mostly about Anastasia trying to help Gertrude Stein uh, make some friends and have